the Christ has gathered his disciples and he said, I want you to go forth and carry the message to all whom you meet. And he starts giving them instructions. And towards the end of those instructions, we come to today's scripture, which is recorded in the 10th chapter of Matthew, the 16th through the 20th verses. I'm using the NIV version in case you see a difference on the screen from what I'm reading. See, I'm sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me. As a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you will speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. This is the word of God for all people of the world. Amen. Thank you, Don. I appreciate your reading this morning. And I've got to say before I begin, last week I meant to say something about the choir and this morning getting to sit and listen to the men sing. I have the absolute best seat in the house. Uh, last week it was a blessing to hear the choir sing, and, and of course it was such a blessing to hear the men sing as well. Can we take a moment to bow our heads and ask for God's blessing on our message today? Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who has instructed his disciples. And as we read this 2,000 years later, we listen for your Holy Spirit to speak, speak fresh words into our lives today. I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. One of the exciting things that happened at Raynell United Methodist Church while I was there was when we opened the doors between the overflow and the sanctuary. Back in the day when the town was booming because of the lumber industry, the sanctuary couldn't hold everyone, and so the overflow provided additional seating. But over the years, when the lumber company closed and the interstate was built, their local economy took a hit and their population began to decline. And so the people in that congregation, they were afraid that it was inevitable that at some point their church would close. And somewhere around that time, they closed the doors between the sanctuary and the overflow. And for me, that was very symbolic, as if they had reached a point of no return. Thankfully, before I arrived, there were some pastors who had come who had cast some vision and helped the congregation have hope for the future. They laid a foundation, and I tried to build on that foundation by opening the doors to the overflow. And it was exciting because there were times that we needed it, for additional seating. It was exciting, but the, the main function of the overflow was that we turned it into a welcome center. And so on Sunday mornings when we would gather, 
we, we kind of changed it from a, a setting that was more like a library to a welcoming place for people to gather about 45 minutes before the worship service. And we had places for people to sit and fellowship. And each week, we offered a continental breakfast. And it wasn't anything flimsy. Our United Methodist women, they provided biscuits and sausage and eggs and fruit. And Anybody getting hungry yet? <laughs> Coffee, pastries, juice, the whole nine yards. And we started doing this at a time that was kind of strategic. There were other things that were happening in the church, and we really started to see our church grow because there was this great element of fellowship, and there was this kind of electricity, this buzz in the community that something was going on at the Raynell United Methodist Church. It was really excited to, exciting to be a part of that. But we all know that any time something good happens, there are always some growing pains. Amen? And there were two growing pains that came with the development of our Welcome Center. The first was that people would come and they would eat and they would be telling these big fish stories and they would be talking and they wouldn't hear the musicians as they started to play the prelude. And they were kind of talking, laughing, and joking as the worship service began. The second growing pain that came along with the development of our Welcome Center was that on Communion Sundays, since I served a two-point charge, I was often running short on time, and so we wouldn't have a closing hymn. People were just expected to process to the line to get their cup, the cup and the bread, and to, to go back to their seat, and then I would offer the benediction to send them out to go into the world to make disciples. And one of the things that was happening was people were processing through the line, they were getting the bread and the cup, but instead of going back to their seats, they were returning to the welcome center. And they were picking up their conversations where they left off. And so as the pastor of this wonderful growing congregation, I had the opportunity for a teaching moment to help explain a little bit about the theology of a worship service. And so first I explained that when we hear the music begin, during the prelude, that is an opportunity for us to kind of pause and stop whatever we're doing, to gather into the sanctuary, and to prepare our hearts and minds for a time of worship. And then I also explained that on the Sundays that we receive communion, that the worship service isn't over after we receive communion. That that little piece in the bulletin that we call the benediction or the sending, it's not a formality. In fact, it has deep theological significance. Because when you and I go from this place on Sunday mornings, we never simply leave. We are always sent. God sends us out as representatives of the kingdom of God to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. In fact, this idea of being sent was so important to the earliest Christians that the term apostolos, this Greek word, became the formal designation for Jesus' leaders in this newly formed community. Apostolos means sent ones, and it's where we get the word apostles. We as Christians, we are sent ones. We are sent to carry out the mission of Jesus Christ in the world. In fact, we hear this important word in our scripture text today that was just read just a few minutes ago, except Jesus uses it in the verbal form. He says, behold, I send you out. But did you notice what follows after that? Jesus says, behold, I send you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as wise as serpents and as innocents as doves. This is a dangerous benediction. Behold, I send you out like sheep among wolves. The disciples have been following Jesus for some undisclosed period of time, presumably months, when Jesus determined that they were ready to be sent out. They had witnessed Jesus healing the sick, 
showing God's grace and mercy and forgiveness and inviting all those who are on the margins to join God's family. They had watched Jesus heal the sick and now it was their turn to take what they had learned and put it into practice. As a good leader, Jesus knew that he could not keep the disciples within arm's reach. He knew that he had to trust the disciples He had to trust that God would protect them on their journey. And he also had to come to the realization that the disciples might really mess up. That they might fall flat on their faces. And so in essence, Jesus didn't micromanage the disciples. He was taking a chance. He was taking a risk. And in doing so, he was completely honest with the disciples about the challenges that they would face along the way. Behold, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Today is our last Sunday in this sermon series. It is really hard for me to believe that. It has gone by really quickly. And over the last few weeks, I've shared with you that I believe that a good pastor is supposed to look like Jesus and smell like sheep. I've shared with you my story, and I've invited you to share your story with me. I've shared with you that my motto is, who we are is more important than what we do. I've shared with you my weaknesses, my failings, my shortcomings, my limitations as a person, and the fact that I personally need to cast all of my cares at Christ's feet. And my hope, my prayer, is that the underlying message of each of these sermons is that you hear that I love you already and that I'm here for you. To the best of my ability as your pastor, I want to walk with you through the ups and downs of life. I want to join you through the heartaches, be with you through illnesses, and journey with you through the loss of a loved one. However, I'm afraid that sometimes our concept of what a pastor is and what a pastor does kind of stops there. And so before we conclude this series, I want to expand a little bit more on my theology of pastoral leadership. I'm convinced that one of the most important roles, if not the most important responsibilities of being a pastor is to be a teacher. In fact, when we look at Ephesians chapter 4, Paul uses these terms, pastor and teacher, as synonyms. He goes on to say that the responsibility of a pastor is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That we're supposed to give you what you need to do the work of the ministry so that together we might grow to maturity in the faith. I see a lot of parallels between Paul's teaching in Ephesians chapter 4 and Jesus' relationship with the disciples in Matthew chapter 10. Jesus had been with the disciples for several months. He had been teaching them, training them, and equipping them to do the work of the ministry, not to keep them close and not to keep them safe, but to send them out as representatives of the kingdom of God. Now, I know that there are a lot of churches who have come to believe that it's really the pastor's primary responsibility to try to recruit more people and to get more people to come to the church. And if that's what you believe, that's okay because you're in good company. There are a lot of people who think that as well. But there are some problems with this. First of all, logistically, it's not possible for the pastor to be the lead administrator of the church, to be a pastoral counselor, to be a worship leader, and to also be the primary evangelist of the church. It just doesn't work out logistically. But the second problem, and probably more important problem, is that it's just not biblical. It's not biblical for the pastor to be the primary evangelist of the church, to go out and to spread the message. If we pause for a moment and think about it, who has a greater opportunity of influence with your friends and your family and the people in your network, in your circle, to bring them to Christ? You or me? The answer is really simple. 
It's you. Yes, I want to meet all of your friends. I want to meet your relatives, all of your acquaintances, and I will invite them to come to church, but st- statistically, you have a much greater chance of reaching them for Christ than I do. And so you might ask the question, well, pastor, I don't really know how I'm supposed to do this. I don't feel comfortable. I'm not confident. I don't know enough about the Bible or the Christian faith to talk to my family. I just, this just isn't who I am. I need you to do this for me. Well, guess what? That's my job, to help give you the tools, to equip you, to train you, to help you to become comfortable, to help you to become confident, so that each and every day you're growing in your walk with Jesus Christ, so that you're being transformed in his likeness, so that the people around you see Christ in you, and they're compelled to follow him as well. And so, in addition to praying with you, and counseling you, and comforting you, and visiting you, it's my responsibility to challenge you and to offer a dangerous benediction. To remind you that our mission as the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. To remind us each and every week, whether explicitly or implicitly, that our mission isn't inward, to satisfy our own preferences, but it is outside of the walls when we go to lead other people to Jesus Christ. It is my job and my responsibility to remind us that following Jesus Christ and taking him seriously is the most challenging thing that we will ever do in our lives. It's always a dangerous benediction. A few years ago, we were teaching our son Carter how to to ride a bike. And as he was listening to me rehearse my sermon in the car last night, he was correcting my story a little bit. (laughs) But a few years ago, we were teaching Carter how to ride a bike, and thankfully we lived right next to the elementary school where there was a flat paved surface. And so for several evenings, Alicia went out with him to work with the basics, how to pedal, how to brake, how to steer. And after he got these things down, it was my job to go out and help him with balance. And I hadn't really thought about it for about 25 years at that point, how to balance on a bike. Because it's not something that you really teach theoretically, is it? It's something that you have to learn from experience. And so it was a great way for us to spend some quality time together. And as I held onto the back of his seat and ran with him, I also lost a few pounds. So it was a (laughs) win-win. So as he was riding around in the parking lot, I held onto the seat. And we did that for for days, but I ran with him the whole way. And finally, when I thought he was ready, we sat down on the sidewalk, and Carter is a cautious person, and I I explained to him last night that that means that he's smart, right? Cautious is smart. And so we sat down, and we, we talked, and I said, buddy, I think you're ready to do this. You're ready to ride on your own, but what that means is I'm gonna have to let go. And there's a chance that if you lose your balance, that you're gonna skin your knee and it's gonna hurt really bad. But there's also a chance that you're not gonna skin your knee and you're gonna love this so much. And even if you do skin your knee, you just gotta get back up and try it again. And he said, I'm ready. So I held on to the seat and I ran with him as he went until I knew he had balance and then I let go. And I'm starting to realize that being a parent is really just a series of learning how to let go, isn't it? Over and over and over again. And as parents, we don't really like to do that a lot because even though there are some benefits, we as parents, we think about the risks. We don't like to let go. But at the same time, I will never forget listening to him squeal and seeing that smile on his face that he had learned to do something, that he had accomplished something. And I think the same thing could be true for pastors, that we love our flock. 
We want to care for you. We want to protect you. We want to keep you safe. But the truth is that our main responsibility and, and, and main responsibility and task is to let go. To not protect you, but to send you out as sheep among wolves. To be representatives of the kingdom of God. To carry out the risky and challenging work that Jesus set before us. The application for this morning's sermon is so incredibly practical. It's stuff that you guys can accomplish this morning before you leave. The first thing that I want you to think about is I believe that our congregation is going to grow. Amen? Amen? I believe that our church is going to grow. But churches never grow without growing pains. It doesn't happen. It can't happen. As your pastor, I'm going to be calling you as a congregation each week. I'm going to be challenging you, asking you to stretch yourself, asking us as a church to, to, to as much as we can, to stop looking on the inside and start looking on the outside. And sometimes that's hard. And sometimes it hurts. But doing the work and ministry of Jesus is about sacrifice. So I'm inviting you, if you'd be willing, to support this and to just keep this in prayer that part of being a growing church is being a changing church as well. The second thing that I want to challenge you to do is to make it a priority to be a part of our Wednesday, wonderful Wednesday Bible studies. And if you can't do that, be a part of some spiritual formation group and a place where you are being challenged, where you're being stretched to think, where you're asking those difficult questions of, am I really following Jesus with all that I have? It's something important. As a pastor, I'm kind of a teaching pastor. I like to include teaching in, in my messages, but on Wednesday nights, we're going to really be getting knee-deep into the biblical text. And starting in September, we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark. I would love to see so many people from this church at our wonderful Wednesday Bible study that we have trouble finding enough seats. This will be a place for us to learn and grow. And the third application for this morning, which is so incredibly practical, is if you look at the bottom, the very last item of worship in your worship bulletin, you'll notice that it says sending music. And once again, this isn't a formality. This is of great theological significance. We can't sing our mission song and then sit down during the sending music. And so this morning, as Craig begins playing the sending music, I'm going to invite our acolyte to come up during our closing hymn. And at the conclusion of our mission song, we don't just leave, we are sent. We begin marching. We go out of this place to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's not just this morning. It'll be next week and the week after that, too. So I realize it might take us a while to get in the rhythm of that, but it's important for us to be sent people going out to carry out the mission of Jesus. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.